Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our final session. If you are wondering why I am speaking English and why we are still broadcasting at this late hour, 6 p.m., it's because we have a very special guest from San Jose, California, which I will introduce in a minute. Our session is headlined, second best, the status of the European internet economy. And I would like a second question, aren't we even third best behind China and the USA? I guess this will be a main question that we will discuss in the next 45 minutes. And if there was one takeaway of the two days of discussions that we had in the past 48 hours here at the German Economic Forum, it was maybe this, let's not look towards the USA and how the elections will end, let's focus on Europe. We need to get our act together. And because there's politicians on the panel, I would like to start with a quote from John Kornblum, who was with us earlier this afternoon. He said the following in another session. No other system can deliver a better foundation for a digital connected world than the free system of Western civil society. But it can't be defined by the bureaucratic structure known as the European Union. Digest that. So we need to work together in the West, but we need to get our act together in Europe. Our panelists are, ladies first, Apana Bava, COO of Zoom. And we're actually running this platform was of, uh, on Zoom. So thank you very much and a warm welcome from uh, San Jose in California. And René Obermann, he's co-head of Europe of Warburg Pinkus and chairman of the supervisory board of Airbus. He was with us last year already at Paul's Church today in a digital manner, and Thomas Jatzombek. He is responsible for digital economy and startups at uh, the Federal Ministry for Economics and Energy. And last but not least, our anchorman in Berlin, Friedbert Pflüger, chairman of the Internet Economy Foundation, former politician, but he knows about the digital economy. A better moderator we couldn't have found, and with that, Over to you, Mr. Pflüger. Enjoy the session. Well, thank you and uh, welcome from my side, from Berlin, to, to all of you who are listening today. Uh, we have a, uh, with the Internet Economy Foundation, that's a foundation which was founded four years ago by a few leading digital uh, entrepreneurs in Germany. And the aim of the Internet Economy Foundation is to catch up with the US, catch up uh, with China, and uh, lay the groundwork as a think tank, as an independent think tank, so that we are doing better. And uh, just recently, uh, the IEF, the Internet Economy Foundation, together with Warburg Pincus and with Roland Berger, uh, published a study which is called the status of the Internet Economy Foundation, of the internet economy in, in Germany and in Europe. And uh, well, we said in this panel, second best. I think if you look to the outcome of this study, you see we are probably even third uh, after the US and China. And while it is true that we do make progress, uh, we are uh, lacking far behind in a few very important areas, venture capital, investment gap, uh, the whole infrastructure, uh, clouds and uh, 5G, uh, and of course the question of a fair platform uh, economy where we have a lot of problems in, in Germany facing uh, the big players in the market from the United States and from China. And one of the key players Uh, and one of the authors of this study is René Obermann, who is uh, next to his uh, function as, as the uh, co-managing uh, director of Vargos Pincus in Europe, also a member of the uh, Internet, Internet Economy Foundation's board. He was one of the initiators of that study. Uh, and uh, uh, René, before I give you the floor as the first speaker to introduce this a little bit, Let me say just one word to the rules. Every one of you has four to five minutes for the introduction because we want to have time for discussion here in the panel, but also with the audience. Uh, so to all of you who are listening, 
uh, you have your chat function on the right side, and in the uh, chat function, you have the link to Slido, and there you can uh, pose your questions, and we will try our utmost to bring you in in these 45 minutes that we have before us. But uh, first of all, the floor is uh, to Rene, please. Yeah, I want to be uh, very brief in, um, in describing the situation. In, in my view, and, and I come from, from the digital infrastructure side, <clears throat> more or less, from the telecommunications and now cloud infrastructure side, um, you know, Europe has a lot to offer. It's a very attractive environment for, for people to live. And therefore, it should have all the ingredients to attract and retain talent. And if I look at, you know, what really unleashes, um, you know, this potential of continuing on a fast growth uh, for the internet economy, there are a couple of factors which today are either in place suboptimally or are not in place yet at all. And let me start with, uh, with five or six points only, and then I hand it over to my, my, my panel co colleagues. Um, the, the barriers to grow, we can remove. And the one thing is that Europe as a, as a whole is still a very fragment, fragmented market. It could be a market of some 500 million people, but there are you know, so many jurisdictions and still so many different languages and so on. In a company which we are invested, for instance, we're trying to um, enter into some Eastern European markets. And really you need to have a lot of you know, assets on site in order to do that. You can't simply register and set up a business and provide services cross border. There are just many things to, to overcome. So creating one single European market and complete that single digital European market, removing all the barriers from a regulatory point of view. And ideally then, uh, you know, this could be an easier market to address of significant size, which is the big benefit of US uh, companies. The other thing is digital infrastructures. We, we have been lagging behind for quite some time. And when I look at what's ahead, I see the need to be on the leading edge in 5G. Um, because in wireless data, this is where the music plays. In fixed line data volume grows, but in wireless it grows exponentially. And the requirements of people to have better quality of service, higher data throughput and speed and quality is amazing, is very high. Currently in Europe, on average, a user is seven and a half gigabyte per month. That's just nothing. If you look into other markets like in Scandinavia or in India, um, for the same purpose, you, you're talking 20 gigabyte a month already, and we're only scratching the surface. So wireless infrastructure is of, of essence, and it needs to be ahead rather than behind everybody else. Third element I would like to mention is education. You know, and we need some patience because on education, we've been lagging behind for a long time, particularly in Germany, but also in some other European markets, digital education in particular, but in particular, but also entrepreneurial education. The fourth point is capital. We have improved the situation, but there is still a wide open space for late stage growth or later stage growth uh, financing. So when companies need bigger investment tickets, um, this is still not to the same extent available as it would be in the United States. Investors do in many cases not have a long enough breadth in order to finance you know, aggressive growth uh, uh, um, uh, initiatives and companies. And then entrepreneurship, I think we have a very, let's say, ambiguous uh, attitude towards uh, entrepreneurs and we need to do better there. That's a societal challenge overall. And lastly, I think we need some patience. We cannot fix the situation and believe we can fix it in three years. It'll be a many, many years um, process. And we as a society need to, to, to do everything we can, but we should be realistic. It'll take some time. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. And we now turn to our guest from the United States, uh, directly from Silicon Valley, uh, Aparna Baba. Uh, may I say she, she started her career as a, a corporate and securities attorney, uh, worked then in several uh, companies and is today COO of, well, one of the most successful companies in the world. Uh, as far as I know, Zoom had about 10 million customers a day uh, early this year, and now it has 300 million customers a day. Of course, uh, COVID helped with that, 
but it is an enormous growth, a growth factor by of 30. Uh, and uh, well, a partner, it is a, a great a privilege to have you directly uh, from the US, from California, and we're we're most interested uh, to get your message. Please. Thank you so much, Dr. Fluger, for the introduction. I am very excited to join the fellow panelists today, and I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but at least we have Zoom to help bridge the distance, so that's great. Um, let me talk a little bit first about our commitment to Germany and the alignment with German and European policy priorities. So Germany for us is incredibly important, as is Europe as a whole. And we are very proud that a large number of the world leading German universities and institutions rely on Zoom, including Berlin, Köln, Munich, Hamburg, Frankfurt, and you know, lots of other places within Germany. Um, we're also very grateful for our new partnership uh, that we just announced with Deutsche Telekom um, that is the standard bearer for German technology around the world. Uh, so while Zoom is relatively new in the German market, you know, of course, we are a U.S. company founded in the U.S. in 2011, we understand that our success in Germany depends not only on our products, but also on our values and alignment with the policy priorities of Germany and Europe as a whole. And we definitely respect the importance placed on privacy, data protection, and other fundamental rights by German policymakers um, and users. And we're taking several steps to reflect this priority in our business uh, around the world and in Germany in particular. So for example, we have recently implemented an end-to-end -end encryption option for all of our users, both free and paid, to ensure that they have a choice to make their meetings as secure as possible. I mean, of course, there's a little bit of a trade-off with usability, but they get to make that choice. We are pursuing key certifications so that German governments and companies have as much confidence as possible in the security and privacy of our products. And we also talk frequently to German policymakers and regulators, including federal security officials, state level data protection authorities, um, to explain our business and get our feedback. Our approach is one of engagement. Um, you know, as the introduction was laid out today, you know, this is a this is a conference around the expansion of German uh, Germany and Europe in, as a whole into the technology industry. Um, we want to make sure we listen to and align with German priorities, and so we are our our model is one of engagement. We see our approach as completely aligned with the direction of digital policy in Germany and Europe as a whole, um, including many of the conclusions in this internet economy report. We agree with the European Union's effort to ensure that digital platforms operate fairly and transparently. We support Europe's efforts in you know, the secure data transfer following the Schrems II decision. And finally, we support Europe's efforts to increase the competitiveness of its own tech companies and workers to ensure that German and other European entrepreneurs and st startups can thrive and innovate. And it's ironic because as you talk, Dr. Fluger, about you know being, as Americans would say, the little guy, you talk about us as being a, a, a big US company, but we actually view ourselves as one of the little guys as well. So we have a lot of shared interest in that. And now let me talk about Zoom's specific journey in the last few months, the, the eight months or so that we've all been living with this pandemic. You are probably familiar with our services. I wanna talk about our values and the journey that we've been on recently. The past several months have been completely transformational, in some ways traumatic for the Zoom employee base. When the pandemic arrived, our user base, as you noted, grew dramatically. So we ended December around 10 million daily meeting participants. Dr. Fluger, I wanted to just make sure that your audience knew that it's not customers, it's 10 million daily meeting participants. And then we reached 300 million daily meeting participants in April, and we regularly see that level of activity on our platform today. That's significant growth in a very short period of time. In Germany, specifically, our free user accounts grew by a factor of 38 
between January and April. Beyond the sheer numbers, our user base broadened dramatically from you know, what was enterprise that had been our primary customer base and target for many years. Now we find ourselves with a wide variety of consumer cases. I knew that moment had arrived when my own children's friends, parents were calling me around the April timeframe saying, I finally figured out what you do, Aparna. We're all on Zoom. And, you know, I'm meeting my grandmother for a happy hour because I can't really go talk to her in person anymore. This, in a, you know, in a matter of weeks, we became not only a platform for workplace productivity, which we were used to and which we were targeting, but also a critical connective tissue for families, friends, teachers, grandmothers, cousins, students who are, you know, suddenly physically distanced and needed that human connection. This rapid growth has presented a lot of challenge that, you know, unfortunately, we did not anticipate, just like everybody else faced with this pandemic. We had been, last year, used to working with IT departments of businesses. We found ourselves being the IT department to the world all of a sudden. And we realized immediately that we needed to deepen our focus on security and privacy and critical issues in that area. Our CEO, Eric, set the tone on April 1st. We had recognized that we had fallen short of both the public and the private you know, expectation uh, around privacy and security. And we announced a 90-day program to embed security and privacy permanently into our DNA. That is one thing I'm actually very proud of our company. We listen to feedback, we take it, and we act very quickly. That's our culture. Among many steps during those 90 days, we enhance the encryption on our platform. We develop new tools to help users secure their own meetings, solicited the advice of a large number of external CISOs and other security experts, conducted numerous tests to identify potential vulnerabilities on the platform. And while the 90-day period has ended, we remain committed to continuing and improving privacy, safety, and security across our platform. So let me wrap up by saying, I'm super excited that we are increasing our activity in Germany and in a way that we hope will be aligned with German values and priorities. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Aparna. And now turn to uh, Thomas Jatschombeck. Uh, Thomas was already introduced, but let me say from my uh, own knowledge of him and his work, uh, immediately after his studies in economics, he uh, started to set up his own IT uh, services business in 1997. And since then he is, well, someone who is in the digital world as he was at the same time a politician. And uh, he's not only the head of the uh, digital affairs in the Ministry of Economy in Germany, but he is definitely within the German government and the German parliament, uh, one of the most knowledgeable, if not the not most knowledgeable uh, politician. And therefore, uh, Tom, we're, we're most happy to have you and the floor is yours. Um, thanks, uh, Friedbert, for this very nice introduction. I hope everything is true, but <laughs> nevertheless. So I think uh, if you look at the at the success story of Zoom, it's it's obvious that there are all the time new, very interesting players are coming from the United States. And also we see them from Asia, from China. And this is reason enough for us in the German government uh, to make a plan how to improve our our position in this global uh, competitive ecosystem for, for startups and digital economy and everything that's been said about the infrastructure is right. And now we are investing 5 billion euros in a better coverage of 5G. We are investing as a government 2 billion euros for improving uh, our own capabilities in creating 5G and 6G infrastructure, for instance, with open run technology. And we have a different further fields where we are investing. But I believe if this would be the only reason for bringing up uh, global players uh, in internet economy, then I don't believe that Silicon Valley would be best globally because every time I'm there, I don't have the impression that the mobile networks are the best ones in the world there. But nevertheless, something has to be very, very good 
because uh, you see all this uh, very successful companies coming from there. And I believe uh, we have uh, five, uh, we, we identified five sectors that are relevant for us as the Ministry of Economic Affairs for bringing up new players. And the first thing is making financing possible. And when we started here with the Secretary Peter Altmaier, his team, which I belong to, we started with the 4 billion engagement in the startup ecosystem. Right now, we are fostering this and pushing very hard. And by next year, we will end up if, with 20 billion euros of uh, support for the startup ecosystem. And this is much more than every other country in Europe is contributing to that. And uh, it uh, activates private capital of about 40 billion euros. So in the end, what we are allocating are 60 billion euros for making even bigger tickets, even tickets with 100 million euros with the German and European capital possible. So maybe this is the first point. The second point is talents. It's all about talents. And I guess that's what, what's making Silicon Valley very successful because all the guys are there and others are coming and they're very attractive for the best talents in the world. And now we started with some tools to that. So what we are uh, starting to improve is the ESOP uh, to, to make uh, people being part of a company. Uh, and the second thing what we already did is to enable uh, immigration. Uh, with the blue card system and especially uh, for specialists when it comes to, to software development, they are very welcome. And I think we improved very much the way that talents from all over the world can be gained for German companies and German founders. Uh, the third thing is that we need a better tech transfer. We have very good scientists here in the government. We have the DLR, the German uh, Aerospace Center. We have the Fraunhofer's and the Max Planck and so on. And they are very excellent uh, in, in R&D. But we need a transfer to companies and especially a transfer to startups and to SMEs. And this is something we are working on and we will make an announcement on this later this year, how to improve uh, very practically the, the technology transfer from these research institutes. The fourth, uh, the fourth thing is public procurement. That's what we are learning from NASA. SpaceX uh, is existing because of all the tenders they won for NASA. And uh, so this is what we are rebuilding here in some way. And we have three very interesting rocket startups. And I think this is a model that can be scaled also for all the other businesses. Uh, but public procurement is key when it comes of enabling tech startups uh, here in, in Germany and in Europe. And my fifth point is uh, uh, the question about the female founders. And so this is something uh, that's very important for me because we see that there are so few female founders only on the place. And we will come up even though later this year with a huge program for enabling or for fostering, uh, especially uh, uh, building companies for women. So this in brief is our strategy and therefore we also have some things done in antitrust law. We are right now starting uh, the 10th uh, version of the uh, German antitrust law. Uh, maybe we come to this later. And also when it comes to data policy, this is crucial uh, for developing uh, a, a vibrant ecosystem here. And so this is our plan. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I think we had uh, great introductions. Uh, I would like to encourage you and the audience to, to again, use the slide link uh, in your chat function and send your questions. Uh, before they come in, I would love to ask a, a question to René, who was, as I said, the initiator or one of the initiators of this internet uh, economy study. Uh, well, if you see now we have Zoom in the market, uh, another American player. Uh, would you say nevertheless that uh, we in Europe are on the right way? And, and what, is, what is your perception if you see, well, the best communication systems, obviously video systems are coming from the United States again? Look, I'm a notorious optimist. I can't help it. And um, and I see a number of uh, interesting companies emerging, uh, for instance, in Berlin. And uh, 
you know, one of the reasons why we at Warburg Pinkers have opened our place here is because we think that we will find great opportunities in this emerging ecosystem with lots of, of good young entrepreneurs. I mean, take a look at what happens. You see companies like Get Your Guide, um, unfortunately, you know, hit by the by the COVID crisis, but with a lot of substance, and I'm sure these guys will make it through it and, and will survive and, and, and strive thereafter. You have companies like N26 in the, um, you know, in the, in the online banking scheme uh, system, sorry. For, so, so you have plenty of very good and strong companies already, and the number is growing by the day. So, um, you know, my view is we have industrial core strength. We just need to ensure that the value creation doesn't go away because we miss out on making, making use of the data. And that is one area which I find particularly relevant also, by the way, for Airbus, uh, for many other companies in the industrial space, uh, Friedberg, because we lost the first race about con you know, consumer data and user data to the big American platforms, that's fine. But there is a new competition uh, coming and that is IoT and the data we generate from this, from this field. And everything will talk, everything will be connected, everything will measure and communicate and out of that, there's plenty of new opportunities. We just need to leverage our industrial strength and combine it with the ability to connect, to analyze, build data lakes, don't throw away the data which we, you know, which we generate, make sure that we have the analytics in place and learn from the data and become better in data-based decision-making. So as far as I'm concerned, I remain an optimist. I pointed out, and by the way, I concur with what Thomas said, you know, what are the key barriers uh, currently for the tech uh, economy to grow. Uh, some of it definitely is talent. And the other is uh, capital and, and some of the factors I mentioned earlier. So I remain an optimist. I just think we shouldn't try to be what others are better at. We should define our own identities and focus on the strength we have and just add digital capabilities onto it. And that is really the name of the game going forward. Thanks a lot. And uh, Parna, if, if you hear this, this yearning in Europe for strategic sovereignty, for digital sovereignty. We, we have the US elections and almost every German politician uh, has said uh, in the last 24 hours, well, whether it is Biden or Trump, we have to, to see these developments in the US as a wake up call to get our own European sovereignty. And now we are talking about digital sovereignty and Zoom enters this market and enters it with, with great success. How do you align to, to that mood in Germany? Uh, I, I understand you said we are aligning to the rules, but to the mentality. Uh, what is your basic message to the Germans who say, well, we, we better want to do that alone? So I think it's a little bit of a complex question. And, you know, I think it all boils down to attitude. I think I'm just even hearing some of the comments and it's so ironic because I personally have grown up viewing Germany as the leader in technology, the most disciplined sort of leader, I would say, uh, methodical, careful, you know, th that's my perspective. So when I hear this, this yearning as you call it, it's actually quite surprising to be perfectly honest. And I think, I think the beauty sometimes, dare I say, is always in the beholder. And maybe, you know, I I would love some of that methodical precision, you know, careful analysis, et cetera. You know, a little a little bit more in Silicon Valley, frankly. But you know, that's just just that's my own personal reaction. I would say as a US company, I mean, we're a US company. So that's a fact. It's not changing. I can't, you know, go back and change history, nor would I. And I think it was probably the best thing you know, for Eric to start the company here. Um, however, I think our attitude and our outlook is different. And so when I say we look for customer feedback and we take it seriously and react, we really do. Um, and I think that goes with an attitude of curiosity and engagement with, you know, Germany, its users, the companies and the politicians really understand what are the problems that, Germany is trying to solve for itself and trying to provide that solution. Um, I think that sets us apart. I do sometimes think we get 
painted with the broad brushstroke of U.S. tech, I think we're a bit different in our mentality. I'm not sure necessarily how that's going to play out. I mean, obviously, that's up to the German user base to decide whether they want to adopt Zoom or not and how intimately they would like Zoom to play, you know, in their lives. But that is definitely our our perspective. And you will see that play out as we grow our position. Now, I want to just remind everyone, we're still a relative newcomer. I mean, we feel like we are you know, the David versus the Goliath. So we might be viewed as the Goliath now, but not so much. That's not our attitude. So, you know, for example, you know, I think we have met with Tomas already. We are engaging with policymakers should they want to talk to us as well. And I think that attitude of openness and curiosity really helps. I love this phrase, you have to think globally, but act locally. And I think if you expect to play a role in Europe, you have to answer the problems as described by Europeans. Would you say, Aparna, we, we, we get that message perfectly that you align, that you listen, that you understand and that you accommodate and you have done a great job without any doubt in the, in the last months. Would you say, uh, uh, that that something of these strict uh, regulations uh, in Germany, privacy regulations, this uh, enormous sensitivity of the German public towards uh, data uh, protection and uh, data misuse, um, is that a barrier for you? Or would you say you can, for your global work, also learn something from these values? It's very interesting. I mean, I'm hearing the the back and forth. I, I heard Renee talk about sort of not throwing away the data, the data, creating the data lake. Ironically, let me just clear it up for Zoom. We don't we don't monetize the data that we get through our provision of our service that is not our business model. We just don't make money on it. So I just want to make sure that that's established. That differentiates us from some of the other sort of big your uh, US internet players, that is not our business model. We don't advertise based on your, you know, you don't sell your data, we don't monetize your data. We use it to provide you with the service. That's, that's, that's our basic tenant. I don't see that changing um, anytime soon. That is a fundamental philosophy. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've able to build trust in our user base. Having said that, you know, we comply with GDPR. And we work to keep the lines of communication open. There has been a change in the legal framework. The Schrems 2 decision came down. It's thrown a lot of customers, so even it's thrown our German customers and you know technology providers outside of Europe and outside of Germany into a little bit of frenzy. Everybody has to play lawyer, and that is a challenge. And I would say we, you know, just to set the record straight, we believe that you know our reliance on standard contractual clauses for data transfers from Europe aligns with the Schrems 2 decision. Having said that, there is a perception gap. I would say there's a perception, forgive me, I'm gonna make an analogy. Sometimes you want the designer handbag, even though the regular handbag does the job. And if the customer, in my mind, if the customer, whatever the customer wants or the customer thinks, thinks it needs, that has to control and that's listening to customer feedback. I view the, the focus on privacy and security that Germans place as not a barrier to entry, but a challenge to live up to, a challenge to deliver what the customer wishes and wants, um, and obviously, you know, a standard bearer, if you will. And if we can do that, then we've cracked the code. Now, the challenge comes in that we are a cloud-based platform, we are not customized, you know, the Zoom that you see here most likely is the Zoom that you'll see. I mean, it's not a customized software solution. So we have to somehow figure out on the back end how to make it all work, how to make the economics work, how to make the hosting costs work, etc. But that's our challenge and we've got to figure it out. If we want to come to Germany and, you know, expect, um, accept, expect adoption in a mass way in Germany, we need to answer that call. Thank you. If I may chime in quickly, briefly only. I did not mean to say companies like Zoom 
whom should capitalize the data from users like me. Oh, of course. Home. So I, my, my reference was to the industrial to the industrial side, where companies should leverage the fact that they learn from the data they generate, i.e., in a production process or in a turbine or in any, you know, for in radiology and so on. And I would, however, question one thing. I do think we need to discuss the ethic or where the ethic is if we are that categoric against using personal data, i.e. in medicine. I mean, the most bizarre example to me is the corona thing. You know, we have the app and yet we were agonizing for ages as to whether there could be a potential problem with data protection. My priority would be a different one. I'd rather protect lives than I would be too concerned with that topic. I'm just saying, I think we went a little far on the European side with our attitude towards data protection. We actually miss out on opportunities and legally and ethically good opportunities to use data. So don't, don't get me wrong. This is a more nuanced communication we should have. But Rene, I don't think it was directed against you as no, an answer uh, uh, to it. you. It was just a translation <laughs> to others, uh, to other companies who use data for advertising and, and use the data for, for other business models, vertical business models. So I think it was an important point that, that was made. Tom, do you want to, to comment on this uh, Europe-US uh, uh, point? Would you say we're on a good way and, and are players from the US uh, the Davids uh, who are now coming, are they welcome and how, to what extent are they welcome? Yes, they're absolutely welcome. I, I believe that's obvious. And if you look at uh, other continents like, for instance, China or Russia, so they built a wall around and so they created their own players. And some people believe that might be a successful strategy. But I believe if you look at the economy as a whole, we are very successful in exporting our goods and services. And therefore, it wouldn't be a wise idea to build a fence around our country. And uh, this is, but this is in the end the reason why the American players are pretty strong here. And so I believe there's truly common market even if, uh, in times of Schrems too, with all the uh, complications. Um, when it comes to, to um, the players that we have, uh, I would go with Rene Obermann. Uh, so we have some successful startups right now and uh, Get Your Guide is one instance of Flix Mobility which is a global platform champion for bus transportation and some others. Uh, but I think the next generation is upcoming. Now we see really fancy tech startups. And if you look back, the German startup ecosystem is quite young. 10 years ago, this was all completely new. And maybe it's also the reason that we are so successful in traditional industries, in the car industry, and when I see Rene Obermann, the aviation industry, as he's the chairman of Airbus, um, and, and, and the machine industry. But um, we see a lot of very interesting companies upcoming there. And for instance, we have uh, free startups that are building rockets. They're pretty interesting. Or we see in eVTOLs, which are called air taxis, uh, some of the global players uh, coming here from Germany and you can go from one technical sector to the next uh, to see very interesting companies upcoming here. And I think that we are building, as I explained in the beginning, the right infrastructure for making it possible that these companies can scale up here. And that's very important. And um, my aim is to, to get the first unicorns opening up the American market. I think Flix Mobility did. Get your guide in some way did also, but we need this in, in deep tech and that's what we are working on. And one last word to the question of, of privacy and, and uh, data privacy regulation. Um, I don't believe that for Zoom, this is a barrier to entry. Uh, that's obvious because you're here, yeah? but it's a barrier for some startups. That's a problem. The more complex regulation gets, especially when it comes to privacy, the more complex regulation gets, it's even more a barrier for the small companies and the medium-sized companies and the startups because the large players with the huge of attorneys, for them it's no problem to make themselves more or less compliant to all these rules. But for a young company with five or 10 or 20 people, most of them being software developers, it's absolutely impossible to make make them compliant to all this, even getting more and more complicated regulations. And therefore, we need more simple regulation. So this is my aim in this case. Thank you. We have quite a few 
questions from from the audience. Some were already addressed, but but let me um, ask Rene. Uwe Gernhardt uh, asks a question to you, Rene. What would you recommend? What steps should German small and medium-sized businesses take to be successful in the field of the digital uh, business world? In the digital business world. And, and, and you, as someone from the, who has been in the old economy and in the new economy, I, I think you're the, the perfect man to answer that question. Oh, it's, such a, it's such a wide ranging question. I find it hard to answer. I do, I do think that many companies um, sh should really work on their online presence and improve that uh, and make sure that their, their business card to the world uh, you know, is, 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 is interactive, is, is appealing. It attracts traffic uh, and so on. And then they should really go through all that the processes and, and see where it would make sense to digitize processes, uh, both for the sake of efficiency, but also for the sake of customer interaction. And you can do that. You can really start at a very small company like a freelance company or, or sorry, a freelancer to a, say a haircutter to a dentist. They all have opportunities if they deploy um, uh, digital technologies, i.e., understand the value add of wireless. You know what? Have they already leveraged the full potential of wireless access to their services, to their shop, to their uh, to their practice? God knows what. But so there's there's plenty of opportunities. But I think it does require a systematic approach to it, and really redefine your key business processes uh, and see where digital. Uh, makes sense to, uh, or where processes make sense to be digitized, both for the sake of efficiency and for the sake of the customer. I have a, thank you, Rene. I have a question to, uh, to Tom. Um, successful European startups, uh, good ideas, uh, are often bought uh, by US or Chinese companies. Given this, how can Europe grow global champions and catch up with US and China. Do you have a concrete answer to that? So in the end, I believe we did the same with the industries of other countries. Let's, uh, for instance, look at the car industry in, in UK. Uh, so I already ordered a new Mini and now it's a German car. We believe that. Uh, we will see after Brexit <laughs> how it looks like. But nevertheless, uh, so and and therefore, I believe we are not in the position uh, uh, to 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 make a finger point at others uh, which are investing or buying companies here. But nevertheless, I see a lot of companies uh, which are founded uh, uh, by European money. Uh, and for the rest, our aim with our new future fund, as I explained in the beginning, with an additional 10 billion state money, uh, and it comes to with all the private effects to completely 30 uh, billion euros. With, with this big gun, uh, we are heading to make it possible to create tickets for 100 million euros and more also with German and European money. This is our aim. This is clearly our aim. And especially uh, when it comes to the financing of these big rounds, we see a lot of American and, and Asian money on the table and Middle East money also. Um, uh, that's true, but I think it's also quite new phenomena. We realize that and uh, when we start next year with the Future Fund, I hope, and this is our aim, that we can deliver uh, enough support to make this financing also with our local money possible. I have a question. You want to comment? Uh, no. Yes, on internationalization. I, you know, I'm coming across a number of cases. And this is where, where we come in as, as private equity investors to help those companies to, to do this internationalization. I think it is a function of, do you have the, the understanding of local market needs? Is your product easy to be rolled out uh, globally or internationally? And do you have the funding? And do you have the long enough breadth to build a, to build a presence in those markets, a brand presence and so forth? I think it's not a trivial question, but it really depends on a couple of key success factors and one should think them through systematically and then go for it with, uh, you know, with potentially with external financing support from venture capitalists or, or private equity players like ourselves, if I may use that opportunity to do a bit of a self um, sure. you know, advertisement. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, René. Of course, you can do that. I, I have a question to, to uh, uh, Aparna. 
someone asked here, uh, well, there is a lot, uh, Thomas Jatschombeck said there is uh, a lot of work to do in the education field. Um, and the question to you, Aparna, is if you compare Germany, schools and universities, uh, what they do digitally uh, with other countries uh, in the world, would you say we're doing enough? Do you have any possibilities to, to make comparisons? To be honest, I'm not, I think everybody is in a period of transition. For us, universities in general were the first stop along the way in our sort of go to market. And the idea is that that is where they're the most in innovative in general about trying to educate the future knowledge worker. So, you know, even today, I would say German universities have been a significant focus for us since the pandemic. How do they compare with, you know, other areas? I'm not sure. Um, I think there are certain, so, I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a mixed bag. There are certain universities that we see that have adopted us and they're in the five digit, you know, seat license, the upper five digit seat licenses. There are certain universities that, you know, resist the adoption. Um, I think it's, we look at it, the only thing we can control is us. And we look at it as the more we can provide solution sets for the universities and offer it in an easy way, the easier it is for them to adopt it. So whether it's, you know, um, online proctoring, quizzing, you know, organizing your classroom, et cetera. I mean, there are some really innovative things that you can do to help the universities adopt and sort of realize the feature rich set for technology, for, for, for our technology. And those are the kinds of things that we're working on. I would say, I think there is a definite pro in starting early in technology. Now I have a eight year old who is on Zoom all day long in school. I think it's too early. I mean, he's so distracted by the 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 gadgets and gadgets. I'm not entirely sure that or the icons. I'm not entirely sure that he's actually paying attention to the class. But at some point, there the the kids and the the young adults, the ability to take on digital you know technology and then use it and utilize it to become the entrepreneurs that Tomas and Renee are talking about is huge. So I see it in my own child. My 11 year old, by contrast, I'm going to tell you, is a Zoom product manager. I mean, literally, he is telling me, mom, you really should do this. You should tell Eric this. You should, you should change your product to this because this is not a very nice feature or this is great. I mean, he is giving me feedback and he is 11. So whether or not Germany has it enough today, I think we can all use a little bit more because this is your future knowledge worker. This is the, the, the base that is going to be the entrepreneurs and the, you know, the, the technology leaders of tomorrow. And this is where you start. I mean, that is my view. Um, I think I'm also self-serving in that, that, you know, the knowledge worker will also adopt more technology in the future. So more market to, to sell your services to. Um, but that's my answer. Thank you, Aparna. We're uh, at the end of our uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for, for these insights. Uh, I think what was, was most interesting was that you so clearly stated you want to align uh, to German rules, that you respect them, that you even want to learn from them. Uh, and I think that's the best way to accommodate with Germany and to be successful here. And also to learn from your early mistakes. You said that uh, quite clearly that you're in the transformal uh, period. And uh, René and, and uh, Tom, thank you for, for your contributions. Uh, I think we all know with, with your help, with your support, uh, we will definitely find this way uh, to European sovereignty in the digital field, which does not mean that we just uh, uh, built a wall around ourselves. Everyone is welcome who wants to compete, who doesn't want to become a monopoly here, who doesn't want to misuse its position here, and especially when they have to offer a great product as Zoom definitely has. So thank you very much. Thank you for the audience. I apologize to all of you who have asked questions. We could in these 45 minutes 
not do more. And uh, please stay in touch. Thank you for the Zeit for offering this wonderful uh, opportunity to discuss. Thanks a lot and best wishes to the US. Thank you. Thank you.